It's certainly good to be with you. Another beautiful day. I like the uh, cooler weather. This morning I went out this morning about, know, it was about 4.30 and it was 48 degrees. I felt, I felt nice. It made me think of the feast, which is what now? A little over six weeks away. And I was actually, as I was putting together the sermon, I was reminiscing about the feast in the old days. And if you remember back in the day, if you were like me, you, you saved some of your tithe just so you could put your car together enough to get you where you were going. And, uh, you know, he's got a tune-up and new tires, and then you were glad you had those little, st- for those who've been around a while, remember the green stickers, orange stickers? And you knew if you were broke down alongside the road, somebody with a green sticker was going to help you. But uh, always reminded me that we always needed to uh, get our car in shape and a tune-up. And it got me to thinking about not only getting ready for the feast physically, getting our car in order or whatever, travel arrangements, but have you ever felt that it's time for a spiritual tune-up? And that's what I want to talk about today. I know with my schedule and with the way things have been going, and it's, God just makes all of our lives just so incredibly busy, that we often lose, lose focus. We often lose momentum, spiritual momentum. And I find myself in that, in that position at times. And it, it really, I wanted to talk about that a little today, I, I, I guess. And you could think about it in this way. I, I know you've heard it before, you know, that, that sassy little comment sometimes that children make and say, I don't care. Or maybe when they get a little older, you know, you get the well, attitude, whatever. You've heard that? Have you ever said that? You know, you better eat your vegetables if you want to grow up to be big and strong. I don't care. Or when they get a little older, you know, in teenage years, it might be something, if you don't start studying a little bit better and improve your grades, you're never going to get into a good college. Get a shrug of the shoulders. I don't care. Whatever. You know, I know that teachers see this attitude a lot in their students. Imagine trying to teach geometry to a 16-year-old who doesn't care, right? Who, who doesn't care whether he learns it or not. You know, I'm sure it can be quite frustrating for both the teacher and the student, but looking back on what I learned in geometry, and I took a lot of math, well, I haven't used geometry a lot, and some students probably didn't. But at that point of view at the time, they said, I don't care about this. I'm never going to use it. And so it goes. But what is it about friends or family, teachers, ministry, whatever, trying, when trying to offer helpful advice to others, you often get this, I don't care, attitude or, or response. As we're going to see today, this type of attitude can be certainly very dangerous, and it's certainly not an attitude that is conducive to our spiritual Christian growth. You know, just like our children need to care about instruction from their parents, you know, and the guidance from their teachers, we too need to care about the instruction and guidance that comes from God. You see, as humans, it's natural. We, we want the easy way. As Christians, right, we want the easy life. And it's not wrong to say we want everything to work smoothly. We want to have all kinds of blessings. We never want to have pain. We never want to have suffer, suffering. We want to have good friends. We want to hear great sermons every week. We want to hear about how the world's going to suffer while we get to escape and go live in the wilderness somewhere and never have to go through any trials. But we all know it doesn't it doesn't work that way. Even though it seems like that would be fine by us, right? Why not? God's called us. Why don't we get all this great stuff thrown our way? Well, we know that our Father allows us to go through tough things so that we can grow. And when he does that, how often do we say, or by our actions, do we say, whatever, I... I really don't care. I don't care about this. I don't want to be dealing with this right now. I don't need this. 
You see, when we have trials and tests, we often tend to, to think God isn't looking out for us. I know people that have turned around and blamed God. God is doing this to me intentionally. He does not love me as I think he should. What about us? It would be like a parent simply allowing, though, a child, if God didn't discipline us, if he didn't correct us, it would be like a parent raising a child and not worrying about them, never correcting them, letting them do whatever they want. Right? Just no guidance, no help with food, no clothing, no shelter. Just, just do whatever you want. Well, the child would, would probably soon die of neglect, and the parents would be in big trouble. See, we know that children must have guidance. They must have correction. They must have direction from the parent, and so too must we have that from our Father. If we, and maybe I should say when we, develop an attitude of whatever. When we develop that attitude, we allow it to, to creep into our lives. When we begin to neglect the things of God, we're in trouble. Because if that doesn't stop, if we can't correct that, we soon, soon will die also. And I think it's safe to say that we all fall into that mindset at times. And with times growing more perilous, we see it every day. And with the fact that we all know that the end of this age is coming, we really can't afford to have that kind of attitude, that whatever attitude, I'm tired attitude, I, I, don't, I don't care attitude. See, with all this stuff going on, I am in need, and maybe we all could use a tune-up of our spiritual lives. Let's start by looking at Hebrews uh, in our Bibles. Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> We have less than seven weeks, as I mentioned, to, to the start of the feast. And a few holy days between now and then that we're going to hear, be able to come together more often than we have been able to. So what's it going to take for us to get our tune-up started? Let's look at Hebrews 2, some instruction that we're given, starting in verse 1. It says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. He says, basically saying, we need to really focus. We need to put more effort in. Earnestly, it says, earnest heed to the things we have heard, lest we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels proved steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him. I have often, I still probably do often, often end my prayers or in my prayers, I ask God to let me take my calling as seriously as he does. Have you ever considered asking God that? I, I find it very uh, important to ask that, and I, I, I want to take my calling as seriously as God does. What can I do personally to make that happen? But here in Hebrews 2, it's, there's a clear warning here that we, can, that we can so easily drift away from the things of God if we, if we begin to, to neglect them. And we've, we, we hear messages, and, and we know that we, we need to probably all study more. We, we need to pray more. We need to fast more often. We need to give more time to God. We need to think about God more often. We, we understand that. But if we ever really start to see a deterioration in those things, because, hey, life gets busy sometimes, that's a tactic Satan uses to, to distract us. If we ever begin to compromise with God's law because, you know, it seems it doesn't really matter whether we've done that or not. That's a serious, major step on the way to completely leaving God. 
You know, for example, we could compromise and say, you know, things are busy. I'm just going to work 10 minutes further into the Sabbath. And then we, next time we go, hmm, I already did it once. Might as well work a little bit longer. So it gets easier every time to, to compromise, right? You get, we get this, well, you know, it just had to be done. And again, it becomes easier. We start to have this attitude, well, God understands, right? It really doesn't matter. I don't really, it doesn't, I don't really care about it. And then you've opened yourself up again to, the, to future compromise. You know, next time maybe I can work an extra hour because after all, I'm, my job's really important. <laughs> I impact so many people. God, God will, will understand. And this is a stepping stone. And then you find it easier and easier to start working on the Sabbath because if you're honest with yourself, you really didn't care that much about working that extra 10 minutes before. And we can look at so many aspects, really pretty simple things that God asks us to do. Maybe it's just tithing. Maybe we make that decision that I skipped tithing this month because there, there, there's just so many other bills to pay. That's so, there's so many other priorities. You know, unexpected car repairs, whatever it might be, but you just didn't care enough, maybe. And maybe, maybe you felt a little guilt but you did it anyway. I remember being that when I was young. What about the next time? You know, you really don't have to save all your second tithe because I'm never going to spend all of that at the feast. It becomes easy to do, you know. Why don't we just save enough to get by and spend the rest on, on our expenses? It can be easy to justify, although it's not what God instructs us to do. All right? And you, you go ahead and do it, and you just don't care. And before you know it, you'll be finding other excuses for whatever, not keeping the Sabbath, not, not paying your tithes. Um, maybe you decide, yeah, it's, that feast, that's, that's eight days. I can't really, I got things to do. Maybe I'll just go, if I get a chance, I'll go for the weekend, because we just don't care as much. You see, when it comes to our sinful behavior in our lives, how many times can we continue doing, doing those things and saying, I don't care, at least saying that through our actions? You know, obedience to God's law, we all know, takes work. It takes effort. It takes pri prioritizing it in our life. And it takes sacrifice at times on our part in, in today's world. Brethren, unless we care about it, unless it is most important, unless obeying God is the most important thing in our life, we probably won't always do it. It comes back around to this, getting that spiritual tune-up and understanding, am I drifting personally? Am I, am I starting to, to compromise more than I used to? Ask yourself that question. You see, therefore, we have to care about whether or not we're sinning and whether or not we're overcoming and we put it and work on putting sin completely out of our lives. It has to be for the foremost in our mind. We've all heard sermons in the past, haven't in a while, but on the unpardonable sin, you know, that's, that's that sin that a person does and then refuses to repent because... I don't see a need to. Right? They're sinning, and they don't care. They have willfully chosen to live in sin, to directly disobey God, and to, you could say, rebel against God. And they don't care. The end result for them, and for any of us that do that, obviously is the, is the lake of fire, right? The second death. You see... Ultimately, that's what can result from that attitude that we might fall into, that starting to compromise that, eh, whatever, I, that I don't care. They will care <laughs> at that point. You know, the Bible mentions four times in Matthew and once in Luke 
about these people who are cast into outer darkness and talks about that there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And outer darkness, we've probably heard this before, is, is it's the destiny of Satan and the demons. And have you, ever, have you ever wondered, have you ever thought about that a little bit more? Is why is there weeping and gnashing of teeth at the third resurrection, etc.? Have you ever thought about that? I think it's now because it's at this point that they now finally realize that they have chosen to neglect and refuse to accept God's way. Refusing, refuse to accept that, uh oh, I was wrong. And they likely now see the glory of the kingdom of God and what they could have had. Let's, let's look at one of those examples back in Luke. Luke 13. Luke 13. Let's read verses 27 through 29. <clears throat> Luke 13, starting in verse 27, it says, But he shall say, I tell you, I know you, I know you not you are from. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the, all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you see yourself thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. So you see, we notice that the wicked are, looks apparently, able to see from their vantage point on earth as this, this the destructive final judgment of fire approaches. They actually see, it says here, they see Abraham, they see Isaac, they see, they see Jacob, and they see the prophets in the kingdom of God. And it's at this point, I think, that they know now who they are and what they are. And I have a feeling they may recognize some of the other glorified saints as well, hopefully you and I, and what we've become and what they, what they should have become, what they, what they could have become, because too often, and too, for too often and too long, they simply didn't care. We could look at it another way, too. Think about what Jesus Christ went through for you and I. And we rehearse this. We go through it a lot before Passover, and we're reminded of everything he went through for us. Do we really care about that? That's a funny question to ask, you say. But I'm serious. Do we, do we really care about that? Does it matter to us what our sins caused him to go through? Because our sins caused the death of Jesus Christ. He suffered excruciating pain. Think about it. And if we, if we think about it, if we, if we had been there to see the actual scourging and the crucifixion, do you think we would have a different outlook? I think we would. I think we would care that our sins caused that bloody beating if we could have heard his, his screams of pain and seen the, seen the strips of flesh being ripped from his body and said, I caused that. If we could have seen the soldiers pound the nails through his wrists and ankles, I think we would have cared about what our sins caused. But it's it's a little different when we just read about it. Or it can be, I should say, it can be different. When we just read about it or hear about it, you know, it, it may not seem real to us. It may not seem as, 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 as that big of a deal. At least, I've felt that way at times when I've sinned. And I'm thinking, do I really not care? I mean, do I really care about that stuff? But I think if we get to that point ever, hopefully if we do, it's very temporary. I think if we ever get to that point, 
consider this, to not care, I think, is to not truly grasp and understand what God is offering each of us. You know, imagine if, if, if someone told you they're going to give you a million dollars next month, and all you had to do for it is just trust him. Do what he tells you to do. You'd say, okay, whatever, let's go. Is that what you'd say? You'd say, sure. <laughs> you wouldn't say, whatever. Right? It sounds easy. You really want that million dollars, so you're willing to put up with just about anything. But again, it's because you see immediate value in that million dollars. Right? It's, it's real to you. It's tangible. It's only a month away. All I have to do is jump through some hoops and he'll give me this million dollars. And that, that would come in kind of handy right now. But it's there. It's in front of us. It's tangible. Turn back to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Let's read verses 45 and 46. I think we're probably familiar with the story here about the merchant and the pearls, but let's just pick out starting with two verses, Matthew 13, verses 45 through 46. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all he had and bought it. So, Again, we've heard messages on this probably. In the case of the pearl, why didn't the merchant just say, eh, whatever, I don't care. Just another pearl. Right? I'm not going to bother to go and sell everything I have. That's, that's a lot of work for one little pearl. He didn't do that, right? Again, he realized and again, we're comparing this to the kingdom of God, the pearl. But he realized the, the value of his pearl in this parable. And he was willing to do everything necessary in order to obtain that precious pearl. And you're way ahead of me. <laughs> We've been offered something way more precious than a pearl. We've been offered the way into immortality in the family of God. How much should we care about that? Shouldn't we care more than we do that we have a way to become God? And how can we say, you know, I don't have time for all this church stuff. I have time for all this God stuff at times. I'm, I'm kind of busy. You know, like the merchant who wanted the pearl, we, we have to recognize once and for all, brethren, how valuable what is, uh, what is being offered to us is. It's like the men who are also called to be disciples. Well, let's turn there, Matthew 19. Oh, remember the story in Matthew 19? They were called to be disciples, but they had other physical things that they thought were were more important. We'll notice just a couple examples of this. Matthew 19, let's start reading, let's read verses 16 through 22. Matthew 19, verse 16, it says, Now behold, one came and said to him, to Christ, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? I think, well, that's a great start. And so he said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one that is God. But if, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Verse 19, Honor your father and mother, and you shall love the neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, Well, well that's easy. I've done all these things since my youth. All of these things I've kept from my youth. What do I still lack? 
And then Christ said to him, If you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have, give it to the poor, and, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. The young man obviously had no, really didn't have a grasp of what was being offered to him by the, by the very Son of God. And so by his action, he basically said, I don't care. It's not important enough to me about, about the treasure in heaven. I'd rather take what I have now, all of the stuff I have. Yeah, I know I, I've read this at times in the past, and I think, what a foolish man. How, how could he do that? But could we actually, brethren, you and I, ever be guilty of exactly the same thing? You know, could we be here at, at, at Sabbath service, having received God's call, right? God's, God's invitation to be, to be here, but not really making the most of the opportunity? Do we... Sometimes just to attend because we know we're supposed to without truly committing to God's way of life with, with our, all of our heart, with our, whole, with our whole being? Has our passion for God's way of life waned? Has, how's our obedience to him in all things? And these, these are things that have been on my mind a lot. I, I want to just talk to you about these because I have times I think I've been kind of, what's the word, blasé? You know, I've had that whatever attitude. And it appears through my actions that maybe I don't care enough. What about you? Other times we'd rather be, in, be involved in other things besides church. I have a friend who told me at one point, he goes, you know, I kind of wish I hadn't been called now because there's a lot out there for me to do. Brethren, do we fully comprehend just what God is offering every single one of us in this room? Drop down to verse 27. Of Matthew 19. Another example it says, Then Peter answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you. Therefore, what shall we have? And so Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children's, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. You can think about, think about how incredible that is, just to, to comprehend the, the incredible blessings, brethren, and the, the glory that awaits us. And I get it, sometimes it's, it's hard to see that now, when we're up to our eyeballs and alligators just getting through a week, can we truly comprehend what incredible blessings there are going to be for those of us who don't give up, who stick to it, who, who persevere? Turn back to Matthew chapter 8. We'll look at a couple more, one more example of of men who were called to serve God but, but found other things more important. Matthew 8, verses 18 through 22. <clears throat> Matthew 8, verse 18, And when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave a command to depart to the other side. Then a certain scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, 
but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. If I was the guy, I'd be looking at him going, can you say that again? Right? But in other words, he, he's saying even the smallest animal have, have a certain routine, right, and, and stability. Basically, for the most part, they have, they have everything they need. But Jesus is telling him that he had a special mission for him that would require him not to, to, not to put down permanent physical roots right, and, establish, and, and establish the wealth of the world. And perhaps the scribe thought, though, as he's listening to them, that if he followed Jesus, he might get some big job, you know, in, in, in the administration of Jesus, right, in the soon-to-be-established soon uh, new king of Judea. Verse 22, then another disciple said to him, or for, verse 21, then another disciple said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. But Jesus said, follow me and let the be dead bury their own dead. Now that strikes on the surface as being awfully cold, but before we talk about that, turn over to Luke 9. Luke 9, verses 59 through 61. Luke 9, verse 59, it says, Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me go first and bid them farewell who are at my house. Now, we've heard about this before, and we've been explained that these men were were being personally selected by Christ to follow them and, and, and to be disciples. But in my words, it seemed that they didn't value that enough, that they didn't care enough. Right? They, they had something, as we're seeing here, more important to do back home. And as we understand from the backdrop here, it wasn't as if this man's father had di just died and he needed to take care of the funeral. It was likely he was, it was going to be months or who knows, years before his father died. He was just going to, he was wanting to go tend to the things of the family because he just didn't care enough about going and preaching the gospel. Again, in my words, I see it as these men were just kind of making excuses as to why they didn't want to follow Christ at that time. I've got things to do. Right? They're going to wait for a time, a better time, a more convenient time. So I continue again to ask during this sermon, do each of us understand the incredible wondrous things that God is offering us to, to us now? Do we truly really appreciate the magnitude of our calling and what it means? You know, we've heard sermons in the past, we talk about the fact that we need to have, have zeal or remember our first love and, 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 what is it, and do those first works. But do we do that? Do we do more than just talk about it? I had a friend ask me at one point when we heard a sermon on zeal and the fact that we need to be stirred up, he says, just why is it that we keep hearing those messages about being stirred up? Why, why do we allow ourselves to become spiritually lethargic? Why can't we have that zeal that we had when we first learned about God's truth and everything was new and it started making sense and we're so excited because God called us personally? Why is it that we sometimes, as we used to be referred to, have that Laodicean attitude? Why is it in our lives, each of our lives, do we allow church and God's way of life, why don't we always allow it to be the single most important thing in our lives? Why do we always have to be looking at our priorities 
and reshifting them so that God doesn't take a back seat. Why is it, why do we have to concentrate more on physical problems than we do spiritual problems? I don't have the answer to that question, why we allow ourselves to do that. Why do we sometimes say, brethren, just by our actions, I just don't care enough? And we've all heard about the fact that we need to have a, have a spiritual vision. right? In other words, we need to be looking and understanding just what it is that's been offered to us. We have to look at things through the perspective, everything, through the perspective of the coming kingdom of God and our role in that kingdom, rather than getting mired down and focusing on the physical needs and the problems of, that we're dealing with today. And I know for myself, I know it would make all the difference in my life spiritually if I had that true vision of the reality of the coming kingdom of God and the fact that I'm going to be there. If I had that vision in my mind at all times as I'm dealing with all of the other noise in my life, why can't we always have that picture in our mind as clear as it needs to be? I'm going to go to the right page. Turn over, if you will, to Mark 9. Mark 9. Let's read verses 2 through 5. Why can't we keep that picture of our future in the forefront of our minds, in, in what we know in our minds and in our hearts, that this is all temporary? Mark 9, verses 2 through 5, it says, Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no wanderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said, verse 5, and then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, is it good for us to be here? And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So we're talking about seeing this in person. I can't imagine that. You can write down Matthew 12, or I'm sorry, Matthew 17, verse 1. Well, let's turn over there. So we're going to look at another. Matthew 17, verse 1. A little description in verse 1 of, of what they were seeing. That's not what I want. That's what I just read. Let's drop down to verse 5. Matthew 17, verse 5 through 8 says, And while he was speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. Verse 7, But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Arise, do not be afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. Now again, we read about this and go, that, I can't imagine seeing that. But for just a second, what if you had been there and experienced something, if they experienced this specifically, or if we'd experienced something like that, do you think that that might help us start caring more about obedience and righteous, just a, a bit more? Now, what we have is that these men who did see this uh, were uh, uh, 
affected greatly, and they wrote about it for us to know about through them. Do we believe them? There's no doubt, again, that, that, that how motivated these men were because of the things that they had already gone through and the things that they were going to go through. And it wasn't going to be easy. So, that's a hard question. What is it going to take, brethren, for us to be motivated at all times? We've been through difficult times in our past. We've had to experience various trials and tests throughout our lives and throughout our years in the church. We know many people, a lot of us, tens and tens of thousands of people who once professed to believe, who no longer do, who are no longer with us. So many of them have dropped by the wayside, and, and sadly, most of them, by their actions, appear to have not cared. And it's between them and God, of course, but I have to wonder, was, it, was God's way of life, was it too hard? I had some people that I knew later said, you know, a Sabbath was a real burden. I just didn't realize it all those years. Did God's way of life become too hard for them? Was it, was it a burden that they just couldn't handle anymore? They couldn't be bothered with anymore? Thankfully, we are still here. We're still hanging on. Can we say then that we'll continue to hang on? No matter what? Because times are going to get rough. Will we hang on no matter what happens? Have we proven, maybe proven's not the right word, have we been successful so far in deflecting and uh, observing deception? Have we been able to endure some, some really hard trials and through that groan to see that God will help us through anything? I hope so. Again, we, we can all say with certainty that we're going to have many more things to go through before, before Christ does return. And the road's not going to be easy. We know that. We've been warned, and this, this scares me at times, we've been warned of miraculous deceptions. that say that even the elect might be deceived. You ever pray about that too? To let not mean that ever be deceived? We read and we know that there's going to be betrayal by, betrayal by family and friends and who knows, possibly persecution to the point of death. Ask yourself, are you really going to say, I don't care, whatever. Are you really going to say whatever, <laughs> whether I face that or not? I don't care. In other words, if we did say that, we would be saying that we didn't care about preparing spiritually now for what's coming. And I submit to you that the only way we'll continue to be able to endure, to, to, to persevere and to continue that journey into the kingdom of God is if we really deeply care about it. Let's, that's the whole concept of this tune-up. We get distracted. We get busy. We don't feel good. We, all of the things in our life that distract us. Brethren, we, we must have a longing. And if we have children, we must instill a longing for the kingdom of God in them. We have to set that example that God comes first by how we live our lives, not by just what we, what we tell them. Verse 19.
Verse 19, for the, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption to, to the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. In verse 23, not only that, but we also who have, have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not, is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Verse 25, but if we hope, we haven't seen God's kingdom, right? We know it's coming, but if we hope, it says here, for what we do not see, what God has promised us, what we know is coming, if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. You see, that's, that's the key. We, don't, we can't see that glory yet, physically, but in our minds, we see and we earnestly, hopefully, earnestly long for it and pray for it and hope for it to come. And if we can rekindle that and keep that vision in our mind, we'll hang on no matter what because we believe in what's coming, in this, in this hope of glory. Again, the point that, that I want to get across today is that, brethren, starting with myself, each of us, must genuinely care about the things of God or we will eventually neglect them. And eventually we'll, we'll lose them when we're sorely tested. Let's turn over to John 4. I want to redirect us slightly now to something else that we, we have to care deeply about. And, and that is our actual conversion and the power of God's Holy Spirit that's available to us because I think, again, I think sometimes we forget just what God's given us to help us get by, help us overcome. John 4, verses, verses 9 through 11. It says, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw and the well is deep. My point is, she's talking about this living water. Where, where do you get this? living water. Do we, do we understand, brethren, the incredible symbolism that's, that, that's behind this story? You see, each of us really is, is typed as, as this woman by the well. Right? We, we need physical water to drink, we know, in order to survive, and we know that we have to have that regularly, right? every, every day, several times a day. But if we're following what they're talking about here, we need much more than just that physical water. We need the spiritual water. Right? And that is that gift that we understand is from God. Notice what Christ tells her. He says, if you knew the gift of God, you would have asked him for it. In other words, what he's saying to you and, and I, he's telling us, he says, if, brethren, if you knew the gift of God, if you only understood the power of the, uh, God's Holy Spirit and what it can do to change your life and it, how it is that that power enables us to become like, like God and have eternal life like God, if we truly understood every day what just the significance of that. He says we surely would have asked him earnestly for his Holy Spirit. Again, we can see from this this story that the woman here didn't get it. She's, she's too focused on the task, of, the task of obtaining 
physical water. What about us? Where is our focus? Again, is it on taking care of our spiritual needs? Or more on our spiritual needs? Now, that's a pretty easy question. Well, what is more important to you? You know, we're told, I won't turn there, but we're told to hunger and thirst after righteousness. So how thirsty are we for that water of God's Holy Spirit? Psalms chapter 63. I like how David wrote, put this in Psalm 63, just verse, starting in verse 1. Psalm 63, verse 1, it says, this is a psalm by David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Very, very heartfelt things he's saying to God. He says, O oh God, you are my God. At dawn I search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry, parched land where there is no water. And he's asking for this, this spiritual water from God. You can write down Isaiah 55, verse 1, in the interest of time. But it says, there it says, Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. He's saying, come to me. Come buy wine, come milk, come no money. There's no money that's that cost. It's the attitude, again, that he's looking for. Come to me. Follow me. That's the attitude God wants us to have in regards to our need for God's Holy Spirit. Maybe, you know that times when you've been working outside and you just, you just can't wait to get a drink of cool water? That's the same need. We want to have one of as much as we would need that drink of cool water when we've been out all day. That's that yearning, that desire that we should have at all times. And I ask myself, why don't we, why don't I have that all at all times? I, if we're baptized, we've received God's Holy Spirit, right? We understand then we must use it, not just keep it dormant, but exercise it, allow it to freely flow through us, and ask God to continually fill us with that Holy Spirit. Why don't we do that? John 14, verse 15. Why don't we ask God for some of these simple things? Why don't we ask him to help us give us that spiritual tune-up more often? You know, God's Holy Spirit allows us to do so many things. But here we can look at John 14, starting in verse 15. Just we'll review a bit of what God's Holy Spirit does for us. John 14, verse 15, it says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that it may abide with you forever. Again, the Holy Spirit is talking about. Verse 7, The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees it nor knows it, but you know it, for it dwells with you and will be in you. And verse 26, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things and bring to your, you, bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And after I put this in here, again, I ask myself, do I care about that enough? Ask yourself, do I care about that enough? We understand this is a special gift from God right? as, as, as a result of this fact that he specifically invited each of us individually to be here. He promised to teach us his spiritual laws and teach us how to live our lives 
in a way that, that brings us peace, it brings us joy, it brings us happiness, right? It, it, and countless spiritual blessings. Let's look at 1 Corinthians. There's simply no way to understand what we do, to have the knowledge that we do without God's Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, let's read verses 10 through 12. It tells us this again. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10, it says, But God has revealed to them, revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. In verse 12, now we have received not just not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. And I might have said this earlier, but I'm not sure we always comprehend, right, that the spiritual things of God cannot be fully understood without the Holy Spirit. It's like having that conversation with your best friend about whatever, the Sabbath day or and, and it's so clear, it's so easy, you show them. And they, they almost want to understand, but that's, it just doesn't click. Why is that? Well, it's because, of course, they don't have God's Spirit. Let's go back to Romans, chapter 8. Again, do we thirst, brethren, for that spiritual knowledge and understanding that God's Holy Spirit can give us? Or do we ever say through our actions, I, I don't care, I don't have time for that right now. Again, once again, perhaps I think that maybe we don't keep the picture of what exactly God is offering to us through his Holy Spirit. But in Romans 8, let's start reading in verse 9. Romans 8, starting in verse 9. It says, as we jump in here, it says, But you are not in the flesh, but in spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Verse 10, And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give, you, give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of, of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Verse 16, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, again, this is that vision, and if children, and we know we are, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we also may be glorified together. Brethren, what is that going to be like? Does that not stir something up and you just say, I can't wait? I can't wait to see that. I want to be a part of that. Or, yeah, that's all right. Sounds cool. Maybe I'll see it. We, we don't want to have that attitude. Revelation chapter 1. Do we really care? And do we show that we care through our actions every day? Revelation Chapter 1, let's read, start reading in verse 12. It says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. And his head and hair white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like the flame of fire. 
His feet were like fine brass, if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Brethren, this, this is the glory and the majesty God is preparing for us. If we care enough. I hope that you can join me today in, in seeing just how important it is that we, we care deeply about obedience and, and service to God because nothing else is more important. Again, nothing else could be more wonderful and more glorious than the eternal life in the kingdom of God. We know that in our hearts. And we know that we're so blessed to have been offered these things by God today. As people that he's called today, as his first fruits. We, we understand that. If we could only, though, grasp the full reality of this this, as we talked about, this great pearl of God that God's offering us, we would, I think, if we fully grasp it, I think if we did that, we would give it our undivided attention every day. I think we would fast more, we would pray more, we would study more, we would reach out to each other more, we would make sure that no one falls behind, right? We would, we would serve each other more, we would have more joy in our lives, and it would be just too great to express. And think, brethren, as we think about these things today, as we think about now, I do need this spiritual tune-up. Let's leave here today. Join me with a, with a renewed conviction to serve the living God every day in every way and show him that we do care.